Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. I know that in the past, uh, people have taken Church of the Eternally Secure and made, I guess it's called an acronym of C-O-T-E-S, COATS. Um, I guess that's, that's okay, except that some people think that COATS is a bad thing and they, they throw coats around like a, it's a pejorative. Matthias came up with another way of expressing it that I'd like to encourage everybody to use in the future. Rather than C-O-T-E-S, let's call it C-E-S. Just C-E-S. We don't need of the in the initials. Just church of the eternally secure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're C-E-S. We're not C-O-T-E-S. Get that straight right now. <laughs> All right, uh, we're we're starting about ten minutes behind schedule, uh, trying to work out some issues, but we we're up and running now. So thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, um, to the uh, the new people uh, viewing right now. If you're just watching, or if you are uh, in the chat room, uh, welcome. Uh, we have. A, Every Wednesday night, a Bible study, and we are working our way through the Pauline epistles. Tonight, we're on 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. I don't know how far we get. Uh, we'll get tonight, but uh, welcome if it's your first time here. Uh, and for the regular members of the congregation, uh, by the way, how do you become a member? <laughs> to be a member of this congregation, you just need to participate and also agree that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, God manifest in the flesh, that salvation is not earned through our religious efforts, but it's received as a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. And we ask, you must agree that once we get this gift of eternal life, it really is eternal. That means we can't, we can't lose it. Yep. it. We have eternal security. So if you, uh, if you agree with these, what we call core doctrines, uh, and, and you, know, you want to participate, you're in the congregation, so welcome. Uh, all the regular participants, uh, you know, uh, we'll go through, be going through the, the chat room periodically, checking in with you. Uh, if you have a question in the chat room or a want to make a statement that you'd like a response from us, uh, I'd ask you to put it in all caps. I know all caps is considered shouting and rude, but in this case, I'm asking you to do it. That way you get my attention. And so we'll be able to identify the questions and comments that need a response uh, easily. Uh, all right, before we get started, let me ask uh, uh, Sister Renee and Brother Cripps to introduce themselves, starting with our untwisted sister, Renee. Yay, you see my little uh, icon. I'm on James's channel again. That's my before picture. That's before I was a little round, round guy. That's a picture of me. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's Renee Rowland, channel of the same name. And uh, my term of endearment is from trying to untwist scriptures that people twist to take away our blessed assurance in Christ or to imply that you've got to do something that that salvation is based on any kind of performance whether it's abstaining from sin which is just keeping the law because sin's transgression of the law or a living right or changing yourself or any of these things reform reformation of your person uh uh to get maintain or prove salvation and uh so i try to provide uh the right the proper context so that the brothers and sisters in christ can have rest in christ and lift each other up and inspire each other to keep ourselves christ focused and not self-focused so that that's my name and uh if you're looking for a particular verse type the verse number in or the subject matter or a few lines of that verse and my name and a video may pop up on that uh, I've got a large list. I have not put them all in a playlist order, but I will do that uh, shortly in the future. Good to see you guys. I'm excited about studying. Yes. Well, I know that most of you uh, know and love Sister Renee, uh, and 
I'll, I'll tell you, if, if you didn't subscribe to her channel yet, please take some time and subscribe. But I'll tell you what I like to do now. I just learned recently that I can take my smartphone and just talk to it and say, uh, play most recent Renee Roland videos. And it plays her most recent video for me. I, I usually you put it on speaker and, and have that on if I'm driving around so that I can listen to Renee or, or whoever else I'm interested in. But you know, Renee is usually at the top of my must listen to list. <laughs> 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 so that's a little trick that I use. Maybe you can start doing that and uh, play the most recent Sin City Preacher video. And uh, that, it's that easy. Uh, okay. Uh, Brother Cripps, tell them who you are. Yes, thank you. My name is Jason Cripps. And uh, for one thing, I actually, I have many different identities. They're not, they're not uh, secret identities, but of different things that I do. One of the things, is, of course, is, is being on this uh wonderful broadcast once a week on Wednesday nights, which is uh, glorifying to God and edifying, hopefully, to the body. And uh, I enjoy it uh, myself. So I'm glad to be here. I'm also on uh, Talking Doctrine on Monday nights uh, for Monday's Milk. And um, I like to try to just say yes whenever anyone asks uh, me to be a part of a show. And uh, if it's uh, something, uh, fellowship or anything like that, um, I enjoy uh, being a part of that. Um, my, uh, my channel is uh, True Story Live, and we come on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. And uh, we, we like to um, bring everyone to the table and just have uh, open discussions. And I think we've proved that we can do that uh, even with different beliefs. And... Um, it's just uh, I, I'm glad to be here and uh, say hello to the chat as well. Good to see you guys. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And uh, we also have Brother Matthias uh, producing the program. Uh, uh, by the way, Matthias, um, and not only we do appreciate you working behind the scenes and making it all possible, but uh, I also want you to feel free to interject anytime you feel like uh, speaking. You're, you're welcome. We, we're, your ideas are always welcome. Okay. All right. Uh, I guess uh, I saw a notice note here in the chat room. I'll, I'll tell everybody. I, I, I did finish today watching the full uh, video of Sister Renee and Sister Paula when they did their program last night. Uh, it's two and a half hours long, but it's well worth it. Every minute is interesting. And I believe it's a very important message. And I, I, I would encourage everybody to listen to the whole thing. Uh, maybe you'll come to a different conclusion. But I think if you actually listen and you really are fair, uh, consider that I think that there's an awful lot of uh, scriptural support for, for the, the position taken in the video. So I, I hope uh, hope you'll do that. And, well, Brother Luke, yes. I have to say, ironically, Paula and I discussing unity caused much division. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, but that's the truth. Well, I knew I knew when you decided to talk about the subject of women's place in the church that uh, um, uh, you can't make everybody happy. Unfortunately, no. this, is, this is one of the subjects of many that, you know, there's there's two or three possible viewpoints on every question. And when you when you take a position, you know that probably half the people will agree and half won't agree. So you, uh, the problem is that when they disagree, they all of a sudden now you're their enemy yep. instead of just giving you the liberty to have a different viewpoint. I, I suggest when you find someone with a different viewpoint, this is an opportunity for you to learn and consider right. that maybe your position's wrong. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, uh, uh, I had one one more uh Oh, gosh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, even saying the woman's place in the church just makes me cringe. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's yeah, it's like uh, how much are women bound and gagged? How much can they not speak or, you know, it's just it makes my skin crawl. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad uh, that, that people were open minded enough to say, can we just be all one body and let God take God out of the box and yeah. let him choose who he wants? You know? mm -hmm. so thank you. Okay. All right. Let's get into the scriptures now. We are on 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. And you probably know that I am a KJV firstist. 
So we will read the KJV, but we're going to also look at the Amplified and the NABRE, uh, as particularly for the footnotes of the NABRE. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Well, there's a period there. So maybe we should stop there since there's a period. Uh, Sister Renee? Yeah, I want to go back to chapter three because like, uh, you know, you know, there's no chapter and separation in the scriptures. So when he's referring to something being so as this, I want to see what's before. Right before it says, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All are yours, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So uh, he, he's just saying uh, we are it, everything is ours, and we are all one. We shouldn't be divided between I'm of this guy and I'm of that guy. So let a man so account of us that we are one as the ministers of Christ, as the servants and the keepers of the mysteries of God. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Cripps, uh, I'll read it in the Amplified before you comment. Um, <laughs> so then let us who minister be regarded as servants of Christ and stewards, that is trustees, administrators of the mysteries of God that he chooses to reveal. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I wish all of us did that. Let every man so account of us as ministers of Christ. Um, that word steward, uh, uh, I've, I've known that word for a long time and it gets thrown around a lot. You know, we're supposed to be good stewards of our time. We're supposed to be good stewards of our money. Um, just, it just simply means what the Amplified said. Just, uh, I, I want to be good stewards, uh, especially as it relates to the mysteries of God and especially as it relates to um, uh, planting seeds and watering and making sure that every every time I get a chance to speak with someone, um, I want to be a good steward. Uh, I think a lot rides on that, and it's uh, a focus that is important for any believer in their in their walk on, on the the path that we walk on uh, to keep this in mind. Um, very important to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to focus on the Amplified uh, either because there's a little more content there to, uh, that I can uh, speak on. Uh, so then, let us who minister, well, who's a minister? Uh, if you are a child of God, that is, if you are born again, spiritually, you become a child of God. And um, not only are you a new, a new creature and you have eternal life, you have the promise of, of heaven, but you have a job to do. <laughs> you know, when you become a child of God, um, the work begins. Now, you know that we're totally against uh, the teaching that you work for your salvation. We're even against the idea that you have to work to keep your salvation or you have to work to prove you're, you're truly saved. But we are absolutely for working for the gospel, working for our great Savior, God Jesus. So uh, as a minister, that means a servant. And Jesus gave us examples. He washed the feet of the apostles. Uh, and when you, I'm, can you remember the very first time you read that account? I, I mean, I can remember it like yesterday. The, I was blown away that here we have God come down from heaven. And, and, and as a man, he's washing the feet of sinners. Uh, he, and he, he said, I do not think I came to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he came to serve us and to, and to set an example for us as servants. Minister is a servant. And so we're supposed to serve God by spreading the gospel, uh, defending the faith, 
and serving our fellow man with, with, out of love. So uh, when it says, let us minister, it says, let a, let a man so account of us as of ministers of Christ. You need to realize that when you're born again, the work does begin. Now, everybody has a ministry. And, and once you're, you're a child of God, it's like punching the clock and, uh, and you're on the payroll. You'll build up your treasures in heaven, as Jesus said. As life goes on, as a minister, cha-ching, cha-ching, another treasure built up because of the good things you did in service of Christ. And then at the judgment seat of Christ, we, we get our rewards. Some people don't like the idea of rewards. Uh, some people think your motivation for rewards is, uh, should be at question. But the point is, uh, Jesus and Paul both told us that uh, there is a reward system, and we are all ministers. But it says we're stewards. So a steward is, is somebody who is responsible for something. We, 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 we have this great responsibility to represent Jesus Christ and the gospel and the word of God um, as ambassadors for Christ. Mm. So it's a great responsibility we have. It's a privilege to be able to work for Jesus. And it says of the mysteries of God that he chooses to reveal. Uh, Rene or Cripps, I mean, are there any mysteries in the Bible that you have not been revealed to you yet? I mean, do you understand everything in the Bible or is anything in the Bible still mysterious to you? Sure. Some of it's still mysterious. It says until that perfect comes, we're going to see through the glass darkly. Yes. Until yeah. that perfect comes. Yeah. Yes. But uh, since you got born again and as you've studied over the years, have mysteries been revealed to you? Yes. Yeah. Of uh, yeah, of course, but uh, that—that's the—that's the whole point. Is the is the glory of God to hide mysteries and the glory of kings to seek it out. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. Yes, that's wisdom. Yeah. I think this point about the mysteries of God that He chooses to reveal uh, uh, is is can be broad and narrow. And, and in other words, there are certain mysteries that he, that He's revealed through the Scriptures for the world to to get. Then there's also mysteries that Renee has learned as she studied the scripture. Wow, God revealed something to her. And then she shares it with me and others and so on. We all, as we study these scriptures, uh, God reveals a mystery in that scripture. It it's read it you read it a hundred times and see something new in it. In yeah. 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 There's no other book that you can read over and over again for the rest of your life and without at one point getting bored and saying there's no more, nothing else I can learn from it. Usually, you, if you read a book two or three times, you got out of it everything there is. But That's the Bible, true. we continue having another mystery, a, a, a revelation, a revelation from God. So that's why my position on dispensationalism is that uh, dispensation, the way Paul uses it, is as is means the when you put T O. T-I-O-N on the end of a word, it means the act of. So dispensation is the act of dispensing. Yes. So I think God has been in, in act in the act of dispensing revelation throughout the scriptures more and more and more, not only broadly to the world through the scriptures, but uh, dispensing more revelations to us individually as we go through the scriptures. It's not like he dispensed law and then dispensed grace. No, he's always dispensed grace. Yes, he just dispensed revelation of of his uh, salvific mystery. You know mm. how it was going to manifest. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's bad when somebody thinks all their doctrine is absolute. They are right. They won't hear anything else. They can't learn. Done. It's just, I am right on every doctrine. And yeah. and I think that's that's bad. You can't grow when you're thinking like that. Mm -mm. Yeah. We're going to be oh. learning more in eternity, too. Amen. We're going to be learning more of him and being able to see him face to face and learning each other more. And um, I, God, I, for one, can't wait for that. But while we're here, I delight in when he reveals a new mystery to me. Amen. It's the growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're supposed to grow in that knowledge. Amen. Yeah. All right. Uh, unless there's more on verse one, can we go to verse two now? Moreover, Brother Luke. Okay. All right. In the KJV, chapter four, verse two. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Brother Cripps? Yeah. Um, 
we have to define what that means because people can really run away with that. What does that mean that we uh, persevere to the end? Does that mean we maintain our our faithfulness? And if we don't, we lose our salvation. Um, I don't think that's what he's referring to in in reference to being stewards. A man be found a faithful. This is this is our reasonable service. This is this is what we should do. We should be found faithful. We should remain good stewards of everything that he gives us, including, as mentioned in verse one, the mysteries of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amen. That's a, that's a, a distinction that has to be understood. Sister Renee, verse two. Yeah, I agree with Brother Cripps, but I also believe uh, the context earlier, you know, remember we were talking about the foundation must be Jesus and then mm -hmm. uh, the apostles, how they build on that foundation. Be careful how you preach to the congregation or to the brothers and sisters. Make sure that you're building properly on that foundation uh, and the, the, the judgment or consequences for a leader is heavier because you've got people's souls in your hands and their spiritual growth and knowledge in your hands and you're handling the word of God, the mysteries of God. And I, I believe uh, faithful in that context also is to remain true and, and rightly dividing the word and, and leading um, your brothers and sisters. I don't want to say congregation because that sounds like one guy's over everybody. I don't mean that, but a steward, a keeper of the truth, um, to lead these people correctly and faithfully and consistently. Amen. Huh. Well, I, uh, I I question your your concern about using congregation. Uh, I love the word congregation, and I, I'm not worried about it being misunderstood the way you, you said. Uh, I, to me, congregation does not come with the baggage of well, there's a leader of the congregation. Um, uh, and, and, and I think the point that was made in the talk you had with uh, Paula yesterday, talking about um, the, the hierarchy and the uh, establishing like a church governmental system and, and all that is, uh, that's something that I've always thought was wrong. And uh, I think in Revelation, it talks about the Nicolaitans. They were, uh, they were people who Jesus hated because they established a clergy, uh, with their foot on top of the laity, you know, and, and that, that idea of separating the clergy from the laity uh, is not what God wants. So uh, you hear in this congregation, uh, we're all the same. We do have some that are, uh, are, are more experienced, let's call them elders, because they were born again a long time ago. We have hopefully grown and matured in knowledge and, and uh, spiritual maturity. And uh, as elders, we have more of a responsibility, but we do not have a single leader like a pastor over the congregation that we we're having more. Uh, uh, it's by by committee. And so uh, I, I just don't think uh, I would not shy away from congregation if, if I was you, Renee. But if you if you think it's a negative term, go ahead. Um, all right, let me uh, <clears throat> go to verse three. Hey, Luke, I wanted to say Jesus led by serving. I like what Paula said last night. You get up under people to lift them up. And that's what Jesus did. He was a leader by bringing himself to the lowest to lift everybody else up. And when the con when you were talking about like people, the, the, con the, the, the lady being under them, they're lifting themselves up in a position of authority and rulership over them instead of being a servant to them to lift them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, some in the chat room, they're asking about who's hosting fellow Friday fellowship, if any, this week. Um, we, we're, we're going to have fellowship Friday, but we're still trying to work out the bugs of exactly how to conduct it. And uh, over the next couple of days, we'll come up with a, something, but we will have it. And I, I will host it as, as I have, but we need to to remedy the, the, the problem that came up so that doesn't happen again. All right, let's go back to, the, uh, all right, verse three. Uh, did, did everybody get a turn in verse two? Yeah, I, I didn't take a turn. There's nothing to add there. So verse three in the KJV. 
But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. And I'm going to read verse four with it. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Mm. Rene verses three and four. Yeah, I was uh, looking at that, and I, I think if I reference like what's done in chapter three, um, when it's taught, because he talks about the well, you know the judgment seat of Christ, how we're all going to be judged on how you build on that foundation, gold, silver, precious stones. So when it says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of a man's judgment. Yeah, I judge not my own self. He's like, what you believe and what I believe about myself I mean, it's important, but not really. What's really important is that that the Lord is going to be the one that judges me. I have to make sure what I'm doing is pleasing to him based on his standards. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. I, I, I'm getting the feeling that that's what he's saying. All right. Uh, Brother Cripps, I'll, I'll read verse 3 and 4 in the amplified for you it says but as for me personally it matters very little to me that i may be judged by you or any human court on this point in fact i do not even judge myself i am aware of nothing against myself and i feel blameless but i am not by this uh, acquitted before god it is the lord who judges me Hmm. Isn't that true? Um, I'm glad that I went through some of the things I did at, at an earlier age, you know, around 17, because um, I was headed directly into a situation where I was trusting uh, other other man's uh, judgments, other man's um, uh, thoughts and interpretations of Scripture, and I think a lot of people do that. But this is talking about uh, uh, not being judged by anyone else. And the next verse um, fills it in for us. Now, was I supposed to do four, Brother Luke, or just just three? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, re I read three and four. Okay, just, just clarifying, sorry. So um, this, is, this is encouraging to me that Paul, even Paul says, for I know nothing by myself. And this is born. This this is born out in Scripture in other areas too, where we're nothing without Christ. And as Renee went back to last week to kind of reset the 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 tone and remember remind us uh, what we talked about last week, and in what context, this context is knowing that we can do nothing without Christ, and that's the foundation. That's the foundation on which everything is built. For I know nothing by myself, yet am not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. Again, it's back to the, uh, Paul does this all the time, and I love when he does it, especially when it's about this, because a lot of people put themselves up as a judge. They're judging everyone else. They're not judging themselves. They're judging everyone else around them. And Christ alone is the judge. If, if you're of his family, if you're an adopted son or daughter, then he's the only one that has the right to judge you. And frankly, the way that some people talk and the way that I've been judged in the past, I am glad that they're not my judge. I'm Ain't glad that, that it's true. Christ Woo! that does it. Amen. Thank you, Renee. Amen. Praise God. Brother Luke, Paula put, uh, a, can I read what she wrote on that verse? Yes. It, it confirms what you, you were saying and uh, uh, Brother Jason. Now, whether you or any human court puts me on trial, I couldn't care less. I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that cannot justify me. Only the master can put me on trial. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I think it's, I like the way it's stated, but let's think about that. Uh, Paul seems to have a clear conscience and, and uh, he, he's ready for the, the Lord to judge everything he does. But uh, can we all can we all say that same thing? That, uh, that's a good question for each of us to ask ourselves. Uh, uh, let me 
Let me read it again in the way she, uh, Paula has it written there. Let me see. Now, whether you or any man, court puts me in trial, I couldn't care less. Well, in Paul's case, you know, okay, he's confident that he uh, he's not guilty of, uh, of he's not at fault. And I don't remember exactly what the issue is really now, but he's not at fault. He's confident of that. Um, but he says, my conscience is clear, uh, but I don't know. Can, I, I think it's good to be introspective on something like this too and ask ourselves all the time. Uh, uh, on one hand, people are going to judge us. Well, I mean, we know we get judged all the time by, by even the, the, some people who love us and some people who hate us. They're always making judgments. Bible Jim told me one time when someone said uh, they're preaching and they said, well, doesn't the Bible say don't judge or judge not lest ye be judged? And Bible Jim said that uh, the only thing that you do more than breathing is judging. You know, we're mm -hmm. making judgments all day long, all the time. Life is a series of judgment calls uh, and decisions. And uh, um, but the Bible tells us to judge righteous judgment. It's not that we're not supposed to have ju make judgments, but judge with righteousness. Um, so, is your conscience clear? Um, Right now, I would say my conscience is clear. I'm not. There's nothing bothering me that I feel any guilt about right now. Good. Uh, and uh, but I think that's a good uh, a good question for us to ask. And your, ask of yourselves. I think also the context of the issue is whether he's been a faithful steward of the word. Mm. I yeah. think that's what the judgment. That's what he's referring to. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That makes sense. I just don't remember. And I remember the, the last chapter. I'm sure that's what it was about. But okay, uh, well, let's go to verse. Uh, let's look at verse five in the Amplified first. It says, "So do, yeah." Verse five Amplified says, "So do not go on passing judgment before the appointed time, but wait until the Lord comes." Mm. For he will both bring to light the secret things that are hidden in darkness and disclose the, disclose the motives of the heart. Yes. Then each one's praise will come from God. And I made a mistake because I, I would like to read the KJV first. I, uh, I went to the next verse and read it in the Amplified. Go so ahead. Why don't you comment on the Amplified, then I'll read in the KJV for... for uh, Sister Renee. Sure, no problem. Uh, so this is, uh, I love that Paul's pointing this out. And I've, I've brought this up before in another passage. But I can't wait until this happens. The secret things that are hidden in darkness are brought into the light. And what do the wicked fear? They fear the light. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's not because I'm a great person, but because my identity is in Christ, I have nothing to fear about this verse. I have nothing to fear about the motives of my heart. Again, not that the motives of my heart without Christ are good, they're not. That I mean, I'm sure that's a shock to everyone, but my motives of my heart without Christ changing of it um, are not good. But as I am now, uh, Brother Luke, you're asking the question, is my conscience clear? And yes, it's clear. It's not out of, a, of bragging or arrogance that I say that. It's clear because my identity is not in me, it's in him. He's the foundation for everything. He's he's walking beside me on the path up until the time when all of this comes, uh, comes to fruition of all the motives. And yes, um, when I stand before him, I'm gonna have plenty of things to answer for um, as far as how I spent my time and I could have done this better, could have done that better. Um, but because I've put my trust in him, I don't have to worry about the secret things uh, that are hidden. Um, I don't have to worry about the light being um, exposing all the dark things because he's given me a new identity and the identity he's given me is him. Mm -hmm. um, each one's praise will come from God. Oh my gosh, how, how merciful 
is he that he gives me any praise. I don't deserve any praise at all for anything that I've done. Each one's praise will come from God. But that, that warms my heart to know that there's gonna be a point where my heavenly father uh, says to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And I know it's not because I'm a good and faithful servant without him. He, everything's from him. So why is he praising me? I just think that blows my mind. Um, I, I, his gosh, his grace just just completely changed everything for me, and it continues to do so. Uh, I'm grateful for that. That's that's a great uh, great verse. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, uh, Renee. I'm going to read the KJV for you, verse five. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. Yeah, it's interesting how Jason put it, uh, um, that God would praise, and I'm going back to where he said, you know, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. And uh, if he builds on, build on the foundation, if his works abide, shall receive a reward. If if not, if they're burned up, they're being scrutinized by the fire, God's an all-consuming fire. Uh, if it's wood, hay, stubble, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, though as by fire. I'm wondering if, like he's saying, it hadn't occurred to me that it, when it says praise of God, that God would be praising anyone. I thought, then shall, because everyone sees God's wisdom, but everyone shall be, there's no, let me read it um, so I can see what I'm saying. It says, and then shall every man have praise of God. Like, they'll be praising God because he knows the things of the heart and he knows how to rightly judge. But it hadn't occurred to me that maybe men will get praise of God based on their faithfulness because it is talking about reward and suffering loss of reward. Therefore, judge nothing before the time because the time is the day, the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to bring to light. And so we might look at what men are doing and think they're doing great, but then God knows what's going on in their heart. Amen. We could have a total motive we don't know about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we might see people not doing, you know, things as well, but their hearts are for the Lord and God knows, you know, we don't know, only God sees these things. So I had, it had occurred to me that when it says, then shall every man have praise of God, is that God would give them praise, or I don't know if it's saying that then every man shall have praise of God. Like, you know, they're going to praise him because he has the true uh, wisdom and knowledge to know men's hearts and what's really going on uh, behind it all. So I'm not sure which one it is. It could be both. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, it kind of reminds me of some part of Revelation about the judgment. It says, uh, uh, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts uh, and in the uh, NABRE, it says, therefore, uh, do not make any judgment before the appointed time until the Lord comes, for he will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will manifest the motives of our hearts. And then everyone will receive praise from God. That's why I read it. Now, uh, I remember street preaching. I, I used to cite a lot of the verses in Revelation to, to demonstrate how the judgment's going to be for the lost. And but but I believe here he's he's talking about the saints. Uh, but we know that the law. The Bible says that the lost uh, that uh, that uh, the, there's a book. And it's a record of every per person's life is written in that book, in their book. I believe that there's a book of life. Just if you're born, you're put in the book of life. Yeah. And there's a book for each person's life, which is a record of their life. And at the judgment, every person's book is opened up and everything will be revealed. And you won't be able to hide uh, everything you've, you've done, even the things in secret, even the secret thoughts of your mind are recorded there. And um, then God's going to say, look, look how much you've done and and that that is bad all these bad thoughts and bad deeds and so on uh and yet 
Jesus paid for it all. Now we we uh, that benefits us because uh, because our sins are paid for, we can receive the gift, and we got the gift by faith in Jesus. But all those people are going to realize at that time it's going to be shown to them. Look, look how what my life really was—a reflection on their whole life—and they see that Jesus paid for this, the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So. Lost person has that book opened, their life is reviewed, they see all their sin, and they see Jesus paid for it. Yeah. And yet, he loved them so much, he died and paid for their sins, but they rejected him their whole life and would not receive the gift through faith in Jesus, so they don't have eternal life. Right. And they 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 have, have the second death. Uh, but everyone will receive praise. Uh, if this is talking about saints, at the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, where the, the saved people go, we're being judged for the works we did in our ministry. And of course, we're gonna receive praise, but motives for these things are also gonna be considered. And that's why maybe some of the things that we did that we thought were so good, uh, God judges that our, the motives were not good. And therefore it's burned up like wood, hay and stubble. But uh, we did some good, so every person gets some praise. I'm not sure I'm applying it all right. I don't know what really verse five applies to really. Okay, uh, can we go on to six unless anybody wants to say more about five? Sure. Okay. Okay, verse six in the KJV. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Yes. I know yes, Matthias is dying to talk about this verse right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Sister Renee, ver verse six in the KJV. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what he thinks that means. Because mm. uh, what does it mean? I have a, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake. I don't know what it means. I have in a figure. Uh, is this a a? a well, I'm going to read it in the Amplified for so maybe it'll, that part will be more clear. Transferred to my. I'm not. Here, here's verse six in the Amplified, Renee. Okay. Now I have applied these things. That that is the analogies about factions All to right. myself and Apollos okay. for your benefit. Got it. Believers, so okay. that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written in the scriptures, so that none of you will become arrogant and boast in favor of one, uh, one minister or teacher against the other. Yeah, so they won't go back to the I'm of Apollos, <laughs> I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas. So... Uh, so the figure there is like the concept. The, I got you. Yeah, uh, the figure is the analogy that he's given. Okay, so the, I got the figure you. is like a picture or an analogy. Right. So what? What he's? Uh, that's all it's saying is uh, so that you don't uh, think that it's better to be of Apollos than it is to be of Paul because it's all Christ. It's got. We're all one. We're not separated into factions based on who baptized you. Or who gave you the gospel? Yes. So, that, but, but Renee, don't you don't you know how great John Calvin was? Oh boy! <laughs> Come on, don't you want to be identified as a Calvinist? I really want to go my whole life wondering if I'm going to make it. That is something. Well, come on. Certainly, certainly Martin Luther was great. You don't mind being identifying with Luther, do you, as a Lutheran? Oh, no, not. You know, I'm, I'm all down with the Virgin Mary. Me and him can, and baby baptism. <laughs> yep, I'm all about that. You're down with the baptism. <laughs> what? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think he in verse six he he's back to that point about uh, identifying with Apollos or Cephas or Paul or anybody else instead of identifying as a Christian and uh, lifting up any man or any person uh, above. Um, and then of course when when we lift up others or sometimes we can do it or lift up ourselves and get puffed up, become arrogant. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we know 
quite well about some people that we deal with on YouTube that are puffed up and arrogant and, and f so full of themselves, so confident that it's impossible that their position could be wrong. And because their position is right and you disagree, you, mu you are wrong and you must be put down. They won't even listen either, uh, Luke. Most of them that came against that video said I couldn't even watch it. I couldn't even watch but a couple minutes. They didn't even listen to, to hear the opposite view. They're just right. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Let's read. Let's read verse six in the uh, NABRE. Uh, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, so that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written, so that none of you will be inflated with pride in favor of one person over uh, against another that that is that pretty well expresses it concisely and correctly there's a footnote here though for verse six let me see curl down to the footnote and the footnote is uh, verses six through 21 they're going to give us like a context for verse six through 21 here an overview i think it says this is an emotionally charged uh, pair oration. Does anybody know what pair oration is? I mean, oration, I can see the word oration in there, but what is pair oration? Pair, like that's spelled P A I R. Uh, it's, it's, it's there on your screen, but Matthias is highlighting it for you. It's P E R O R A T I O N, or oration with P E R in front of it. Per, per, or, per pair. oration. Is that, is that, uh, maybe our uh, sister Paula is from the per oration. Um, this is an emotionally charged per oration, or it's kind of like a maybe it's a, if it's mostly charged, maybe it's a diatribe uh, to the discussion about divisions. It contains several exhortations and statements of Paul's purpose in writing uh, that counterbalance the initial exhortation. Uh, per means like around or about. So it would be about oration or around the oration, yeah. I think. Yeah. And verse six, another footnote in verse six says that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written. The, the footnote says the words to go are not in the Greek, but have here been added as the minimum necessary to elicit sense from this difficult passage. It probably means that the Corinthians should avoid the false wisdom of vain speculation contenting themselves with Paul's proclamation of the cross, which is the fulfillment of God's promises in the Old Testament, that is, what is written. Uh, inflated with pride, literally puffed up, such as arrogant, filled with a sense of self-importance, the term is particularly Pauline, found in the New Testament only in various places. Uh, the related, uh, it, it sometimes occurs in conjunction with the theme of boasting. Brother Luke, a viewer uh, wrote something in the chat about that word and said, it's like a, uh, a finale to a word, like a speech, usually used to inspire some kind of emotional response or applause. So wow. let me see the concluding. Hold on, it keeps going past me, and I can't stop it. It, it says the concluding. I'm trying to find it. I'm so sorry. The concluding part. Dad, gone it. <laughs> part of a speech, the concluding part of a speech, typically intended to inspire enthusiasm in the audience. That's what that word means. Okay, uh, Darlene says, "What are you reading from, Luke? Uh, I, I hope you can see this because." Uh, Brother Matthias is putting on the left side of the screen here the scriptures. We're reading from the KJV, the Amplified, the uh, New American Bible Revised Edition, and footnotes from the New American uh, Bible Revised Edition. NABRE has a lot of footnotes. You should be able to see it on the screen right now if you're watching. My face is on the one side and the the scriptures and the footnotes are on the other side. Matthias has that particular portion highlighted. So uh, maybe maybe you can see it. Maybe you're on your phone and you, you don't you can't see the whole thing. I don't know how, how it works. But um, that's what these are the footnotes from the NABRE. Okay. Um, all right. Let's let's. Uh,
Let's read this verse six in the Amplified. No, no, I already did that, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Let's go to verse seven in the KJV. For, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. Wow. I know Matthias is anxious to talk about that, too. Uh, yeah. I think it's talking about... The, I, I think this is talking about the dispensing of revelations that we were referring to in earlier verses here. Uh, what you... Uh, the idea of what you've received is this understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, uh, brother, brother, sister, sister Renee, uh, give the KJV verse seven. Give us your yeah, thoughts. On I'm wondering that. why uh, Matthias says, not all right, let's see. Uh, who maketh thee to differ from another? So, uh, who, who is making you stand apart or different, less than or more than another brother, another person in the body? And what is thou that thou did not receive? What, what is it? that you didn't get that somebody else got, or what is it that you got that somebody else didn't get? And if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? So um, it, it's just saying, again, we're all one, and whatever revelation and uh, oracle and mystery of God, uh, uh, God's word is for the body, not just one person so that they can be above another person. Yeah, I, I get the feeling. It's, it's, it's like a person boasting in their and their uh, their knowledge of scripture, right. their understanding, and yet, Renee, as you were expounding, I was thinking for a second: Is she reading the Amplified? Uh, no, and I. But this is how the Amplified states it, Brother Cripps. Listen, for who regards you as superior, or what sets you apart as special? What do you have that you did not receive from another? I think that's talking about from in terms of understanding. You know, like sometimes we learn from each other. A, 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 let's call it a, a nugget. Mm -hmm. I get a nugget. Sometimes I get a nugget and I'll share it with others. Sometimes someone else gets a nugget and they tell me about it. And then if I go ahead and start repeating it, like I oh wow look I look what I know, but I, I got it from from Renee. I got it from Crips. I got it from Matthias. Why who am I? Uh, and if in fact you received it from God or someone else, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Yep. But had yep. it by yourself. Yep. That's right. yep. Um, but yeah, on, on this one, the Amplified gets it awesome. And this is basically brethren boasting in themselves. Oh, let me see if I can. There you go. It's brethren boasting in themselves, um, and not. It's like going to a fellowship and somebody thinking, looking down on their, uh, you know, newer in Christ. You know, oh, I know much more than you, and I'm better than you, rather than wanting to share it with them. And I'm really glad that it says here in that next part, from God or someone else, because that from another is whether you heard it from another man, the fact that it made sense to you and you understood it in your spirit, that came from God. Yes. So God uses us to be his body, to be his voice, that he speaks through us when we uh, preach his word and we're walking in the spirit. But it's God himself that opens their eyes and so none of us have this understanding by our own ability, by our own will. We all tried for a long time and couldn't do it, if you are honest and remember. Yes. But God is the one who revealed it to you. So why are you going to boast in this knowledge that God has given you when it should be all glory to him in all things? Not just salvation, which it is, but this is talking about brethren, and we need to glorify him in all things amongst ourselves. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, in the in verse eight, when we, as we go forward, the amplified uh, tells it connects that. But again, um, thanks, Matthias. I, I I thought that you'd be particularly interested because this is one of the the main things you like to repeat over and over again is that this understanding is coming from God, and if it didn't come from God, from someone else got it from God, you know. <laughs> so 
So all our understandings come from God, and then, then we share it with each other. Okay, uh, 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 Cripps, you didn't t comment on it, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't get a chance Please. to comment on six either. Uh, so I was going to... Oh, Cripps, why don't you speak up? You know, every once in a while, I skip you, and you oh, never say God. anything. Poor Cripps, he's so sweet. Come on, Cripps, speak up. Don't let me pass you up if I've missed you. Come on. <laughs> I, I, I like to be respectful. <laughs> go ahead. Six, go to go back to six, seven, and eight. I mean, six and seven, both. Yeah, so the one the thing I want to say about six, because this has happened to me, and I really react to other people being puffed up and, and arrogant. And the reason I react, I don't know if you guys have heard, heard this said, but... Um, and in, in trying to better yourself and to understand the word more, a lot of times when you're reacting to something, they, they, I, I've heard it said that if you're reacting to something in someone else, you're, you're reacting because you see it in you. And, and this happens in parenting a lot, where a parent reacts to something their child is doing. And uh, they, if they're willing to look at themselves, they see that they're reacting because they're recognizing something that they themselves struggle with. And when I look back at my for the former version of myself at, an, at a younger age, I know that I was arrogant. I believe that I knew more about scripture than I did. And um, I don't want that. I don't want to be puffed up. I don't want to be arrogant. And um, uh, verse 7 uh, brings the point home. Why would I brag or boast about something that God has clearly shown me that it's all from him, that, that I don't come up with revelations on my own? I mean, yes, God reveals things to me, but that's him revealing it to me. And each of us has that same opportunity to have the mysteries revealed to us. And it happens by studying. It happens with fellowship. It happens... Yes, indeed, by having conversations or discussions with fellow believers. But each of those revelations comes from God. It doesn't come up because I'm such an intelligent guy. I, it, that, I, this is something that when I hear people being arrogant, I hear people saying, yes, this is correct. This is this doctrine is correct. This is, this is it. And I, I hear them boasting, and there's this reaction that I get internally. And I react to it because I see that in myself, that that fight, that battle not to be arrogant and not to be puffed up. And thank God, by his grace, he's worked on this in me for so long uh, that I, um, again, because he's done it in me. He's made that change. He's changed my mind. I didn't do it myself. I didn't decide to change it. Um, he changed it in me uh, so that I wouldn't be puffed up. And maybe I go too far in saying, well, I don't know. But I'm willing to say I don't know. I'm willing to say that I, I could be wrong about certain things. Not on the gospel. That's the one thing that I have to stand on and always be sure of and know that it's all Christ. And, and I don't add anything of myself to it at all. It's all what he's done in me. He's, he is the, um, the cornerstone. Christ is the basis for everything. I can do no thing without Christ. That's the bottom line. So why Paul's saying, why would you be arrogant in something that God himself gave you? It, it's not some divine revelation or, that you got from your divine self. Uh, Cripps is not divine in and of himself at all. So anything that I, any information that I get, any revelation that I receive is from God. So why, I have no reason to boast in that. Brother Cripps, it's not like we sit down and we figured it out, you know, right. like, oh, I figured this. No, I'll read a verse a hundred times and then God will show it to me for like in a second. But Amen. For him, it ain't, it's not me. I can read it over and over again and I can figure out what it means, you know, on the, on the, uh, a general level on the yeah. top level. But anything we get, it's always from God. And he'll okay. show, and I know that he'll show it to somebody else. I'm not special. Mm -hmm. Anybody, he's going to show that any real depth to his word that's given to us it's god all the way it's not because i'm special or great or have some uh you know thing within me that he's, he's giving it to me for amen yeah. amen okay thank you uh the 
uh, when it's talking about the receiving, I believe based upon the prior verses, it's talking about receiving understanding and knowledge and dispensing, uh, as we said earlier, the, uh, the mysteries, un unraveling of the mysteries and getting understanding. And yet I'm seeing that in the KJV and also in the NABRE, um, I don't like the way it's stated as much as the Amplified in this next verse. I'm going to read that verse 8 in the KJV and then the Amplified and, and, and then also in the NABRE so you can see the difference. Uh, in the KJV, verse 8 says, Matthias, you going to put it up? Yeah, yeah. if he would, that'd be awesome. I know he switched off because you asked him to uh, comment, but um, I don't think he switched it back. There it yeah, is. Okay, yeah, verse 8 in the KJV. Thank you, so, Matthias. Uh, now ye are full. Now ye are rich. Ye have reigned as kings without us. And I would to God ye did reign that we also might reign with you. Now, I really have a hard time unraveling that. And look at it in the, in the NABRE, the same thing. Um, if you could show that in the NABRE, Matthias, uh, verse 8. Um, you are already satisfied. You have already grown rich. Oh. You have become kings without us. Indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we also might become kings with you. Now, uh, I don't think that fits the context of the, the uh, unraveling of the mysteries that we're discussing all the way up to this point. Now, it seems to be talking about becoming rich with, the, with if a person didn't understand this context, they pull that verse out and think it's talking about granting, gaining wealth. Look, look, look at it in the amplified they're going to use word of faith preachers are going to use it anyway out of context so yeah. Yeah. yes they are renee uh, look, okay look at it in the amplified verse eight and you'll uh, i think they, they got it right here it's, it says you behave as if you are already filled with spiritual wisdom and in need of nothing more already you have become rich in spiritual gifts you in your conceit have ascended your thrones and become kings without us and how i wish that it were true and that you did reign as kings so that we might reign with you i am getting from that translation that this becoming kings and stuff is not about ruling over our, uh, nations and like having great gold treasuries and stuff like that i think it's talking about becoming uh, you know uh, really um uh, of having a supreme amount of understanding uh, of the scriptures uh, I, I, because this is it says that uh, I'll read it again you behave as if you are already filled with spiritual wisdom and in need of nothing more yes. already you have become rich in spiritual gifts you and uh, so uh, I think the Amplified has it right in this case yep. uh, that, that it's talking about spiritual gifts spiritual wisdom and understanding I, uh, what, do you, what do you think, Renee? I, I, I was going to say, I think he's being a little facetious here. Yes, he is. Like, uh, ooh, you oh. arrived without us. la di da You got, and I just want to praise God for some cow tails right now that they are, oh, so good. I think oh. you're saying that it, he's like, oh, you, you got it all under control. Okay, well, I hope we can, we can uh, come in there and gain some of that wisdom. You know, you got it all, you know, without us. I feel like it's a sarcastic thing. Like, uh, yeah. now you're full. Now you're rich. You've reigned as kings without us. And I would to God you did reign, that we also might reign with you. And he's also saying, so when you or us or anyone is elevated, we all are elevated. So don't think you're going to sit up here. You've arrived and it's all, you know, you got it. We all go up mm -hmm. you go up. And I, yeah. everybody goes up when another part of the body goes up and yeah. gets wisdom because yeah. it's shared within all of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But it yeah. sure sounds sarcastic to me. Uh, you, are you saying that Paul is actually using a, uh, a writing technique or oratory technique of oh, sarcasm? What was that? What was that? Sarcasm? 
uh, you know what? And as I was listening to Renee and, and Paula's uh, talk yesterday, um, uh, over and over again, I kept thinking of the word prosopopoeia. Uh, I made a couple of comments uh, in the chat room about this too, um, but nobody noticed it. So I, I want to mention it now. The, the um, uh, I have a, um, a playlist titled, uh, Was Paul a Diet Diatribalist? Prosopopoeia. If you don't know what the word means, I'll define it very briefly now, but I hope I'm going to encourage everybody to look at that playlist. Was Paul a diatribalist? Prosopopoeia. Uh, and also, the idea of using prosopopoeia as an oratorical uh, technique, uh, we, when we did the introduction to the Book of Romans, uh, we took quite a bit of time to uh, explain this concept and actually do a, 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 a theatrical little uh, reenactment of, of how, it's, how it was played out in Romans chapter one and two. Uh, so I hope everybody will take a look at this idea of prosopopoeia. But uh, Paula mentioned it numerous times and but didn't use the word, but I, I will say that many times you'll see things in Paul's writings that people want to attribute as Paul's position but it's not Paul's position. Paul is stating the position of the false teacher. And then he goes on to explain the correct position. Paul will explain, express the position of the someone who's making an accusation against him. But it's people misconstrue this sometimes thinking that Paul is stating his, this is Paul's position. And I think some of these things regarding the, the women's position that, that you were talking about yesterday is, it was, uh, is prosopopoeia. But uh, in this case, uh, it, I don't think it's prosopopoeia by any means, but he's, he's using another technique. It's just sarcasm. Sarcasm is a, is a technique in communication to drive home a, a point, to try to prick someone's conscience, I guess, by showing them with sarcasm how absurd their position is. So um, I hope you'll uh, watch that playlist with Paul the Diatribalist. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to verse nine in the KJV. Can I comment on verse eight? Didn't first? say anything. Jason didn't. Oh, Jason. Do it. Jason. You know what? I didn't. Did I speak? Did I talk about verse eight? Yes, I did. But I didn't give Jason a turn. <laughs> Gosh, I, people are going to start to think that it's intentional. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm, brother. I'm starting to think it's intentional. No. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, yeah, the only thing I want to say about the, again, this is this is Paul from the verses above. We know exactly what he's talking about here, and to me, it is absolutely sarcastic. And Paul does this sometimes, and I frankly, it, I love it when he does it because he's trying to drive the point home. This is what we found out since since uh, I joined the broadcast when we were in Romans. He keeps bringing the same points around because if he was fighting it back then, he knew, God knew that we'd be fighting it today. We're, we're fighting people that, that get into the Word and they get in their prayer closet and they read the Bible and they, they get to a point in their lives where they think that they've arrived and I did that same thing. And it makes me sick to my stomach when I think about the way I, I viewed myself back then um, and, and how wrong it was. And I, I don't ever want to be that way again. Um, I don't want anyone to be like that. I want to be open. I want to be approachable. I want to know that I can learn along with anyone else, regardless of how long they've been on the path themselves, even if they're newly saved. I, I can get something uh, by fellowshipping with them and learn something that I didn't know before. And that, that um, acting like you've already become rich, you already have everything you, you need, and uh, in the Amplified, I, I love in brackets where it says, in your conceit, I, I don't want conceit. I don't want to think of myself this way. I want to know that everything that comes from God is out of his mercy for me, that he reveals anything to me, anything. Any riches I have are his to begin with. They don't belong to me. They belong to him. So if I have knowledge, I want to pass the knowledge along. I want to tell the other people uh, what revelations he's given uh, to me. And I want to rejoice when someone passes along something to me and know it's from the same source. 
It's from our Father that loves us. It's from the Holy Spirit that rests in us and helps us walk out this walk that we need to walk, and it has nothing to do with ourselves. It's all about Christ. It took a lot of guts to admit that. Well, praise God. He's given me that. <laughs> yeah. Just I try to avoid I, I try to avoid arrogance and con, and conceit because um, it put me in a place where I was relying too heavily on my own power, and then um, God put me in a situation which you guys have heard me discussed discussed before that I realized I have no power in and of myself, and that uh, he he forced me by his gentle cajoling in my life to uh, depend and rely on him alone. You know, uh, is it uh, chapter 13, the love chapter? Uh, and Paul says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love or, or charity. Yeah. Um, you know, I've often struggled with that because I, I know that there are some people that have love. They're, they're loving people, but they don't have faith. So what good is their love if they don't have faith? Right. Um, so I've, I've struggled with that verse a little bit. <laughs> I, I, uh, I think that um, uh, humility, um, uh, obviously faith is necessary for us to get salvation. A love is, is necessary for us to live our lives in pleasing the way for God. And, uh, but humility, is, is is something that sets the, is the groundwork so that you can have faith and, and rely on Jesus instead of and being full of pride, thinking that my righteousness will be accepted by God, and, and uh, you have to be humble enough to admit I fall short. I need a savior. So um, the the problem of uh, of pride, spiritual pride. Look, wasn't that Satan's problem? Wasn't that Adam and Eve's problem? Pride, thinking, well, I can become God myself. Yes. Um, uh, and, and then all those who reject Jesus' free gift, it's because of their pride, thinking that they, I don't need Jesus. I'm a good person. Yeah. That's so the, I, this humility is, is like the stepping stone to faith, I think. Go ahead, brother. Well, I'm just going to add, to me, the wailing and gnashing his teeth is people realizing that, that they had an opportunity to accept the free gift and they were so built up in their own pride i believe that some if not all will will have that that's and they're angry because um that they weren't good enough and they had an opportunity and they they blew it um yep. just the gnashing their teeth over draw oh, he did this to me but you know my righteousness wasn't good enough and and then just the despair that comes from that there's nothing that can be done that that's the nightmare that I would have if I didn't have Christ. That, that's what I imagine that I would be thinking. Uh, but fortunately, again, because of his mercy, um, I, I can rest in what Christ did, and I don't ever have to worry about that kind of um, outcome. Most people don't get that gnashing of teeth like you understood. A lot of times that reference is to the Israelites. They're going to gnash their teeth in anger that Gentiles are in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're outside. Mm -hmm. And that's jealousy, envy, and anger yeah. uh, for the fact that the last will be first and the first will be last. They get that gnashing of teeth is like anger and bitterness. Amen. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the last two Wednesdays, uh, we've gotten through uh, the entire chapter three, and then before that, the week before that, the entire chapter two. Uh, we're not going to get through the entire chapter four. So we'll probably stop at a midway point here pretty soon uh, because stop, find a stopping point. But uh, uh, verse nine in the KJV, let's look at that. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. Renee, uh, oh no, let's let Crips go first because I keep forgetting them. So we'll let Crips go first. Uh, would you mind reading the verse nine in the Amplified for me, sir? Uh, I thought you might want that because that's, uh, it might be very hopeful. And the Amplified verse nine says, 
For I think God has exhibited us apostles as the end of the line, like men sentenced to death and paraded as prisoners in a procession, because we have become a spectacle to the world, a show in the world's amphitheater, both to angels and to men. Wow. Wow, that blows my mind a little bit. In looking at that, knowing that most of the apostles were killed or suffered some kind of horrible end, um, and that at that time, um, standing for what Christ did and believing in his resurrection and even saying the name of Jesus at, at that time um, meant uh, persecution. It meant uh, being uh, laughed at and made fun of and being just being scorned. Um, so we know that what Paul's saying here was absolutely correct, that, that, that he's right. Um, and it's happening to us today and in, in a much smaller way because we don't, at least here in America right now, as I speak, we don't have this level of persecution. But I believe if we live long enough, it's going to happen. We're going to see that in our time. Um, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And um, we're supposed to glory in tribulations, Romans 5 again. Uh, glory and tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience, experience, and experience hope. Um, and the point is not being ashamed of hope. Uh, so um, that's hard to do sometimes to glory in, in tribulation. Um, but just as the apostles did, we are to do. We're supposed to follow that example, and we're supposed to follow Christ's example. Um, he could have said something when he was being scorned and beaten and, and put on the cross. He could have stood up for his his divine uh, right to be worshipped as a king um, and given the opportunity he did what he needed to do uh, and and thank God he did. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted if I suffer persecution, even though it's difficult. I'm delighted if I'm paraded as a prisoner in a procession. Um, uh, but that would be the spirit in me, his spirit in me that makes that even possible because the, the flesh part of me wouldn't want any part of that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Hey, um, Brother Cripps, should I accidentally forget Renee this time? <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't okay. Do that. Renee, Renee, what do you think? Verse 9. Uh, amen, Brother Cripps. Um, yeah, the flesh never wants That's never fun. Uh, I, I think what's going on here is he has just shown uh, the extreme difference between the world's kingdom and God's kingdom. He's saying, oh, you, you've uh, uh, lived like kings. You've arrived. You got it. And then he's saying, but if you really want to be great, this is how you're great. Because in God's kingdom, you're abased and despised of the world. You suffer. The world hates you. It yeah. spits on you. It thinks you're a fool. That's when you've arrived for God. Oh, I, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've achieved it because he said, for I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last. So they're supposedly the greatest, right? They're the ones that walked with Christ and ele everybody elevates them. Yeah. But he says, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. And, and he's, he's showing the difference here between man's thinking, the world's thinking and being elevated in the world and being elevated in the kingdom of God. Yes. Because uh, when you're elevated in the kingdom of God, you are the least in the world. Yeah. So I think that might be a, um, a, a contrast there mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I know in, in your talk yesterday, the subject of the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs was brought up. And I've got that in my bookshelf. I, uh, it, it's a very difficult read because it's, it is so graphic. The cruelty, the, the inventions of torture uh, are uh, really beyond imagination. I, I, I'm thinking how could a human being even imagine such uh, a horrible method to torture someone? I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they could do it to another person either. Sure, wicked. Yeah, yeah. but to, 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 to be able to do it, I mean, how evil does a person have to do to, to do the most cruel, slow, most painful torture to someone? Uh, and then also the invention of, of the devices and the methods is just, it just blows my mind that uh, the depths of, of evil. Um, but the thing that, the reason I 
struggled through the book. And the reason I highly recommend the book to everybody, not children, but every adult Christian, by reading Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, you begin to understand uh, what, uh, starting with the apostles and then through the early church history, uh, and even through the Reformation period, uh, that's where the book covers those periods. Yeah. Um, you appreciate the, the degree of faith and the, the way that they were uh, stood for their faith uh, to the death. Uh, and you ask yourselves, my wife used to ask me, you, you wouldn't do that, would you? You would crack under the pressure. For some reason, my wife thinks that I will would crumble under that kind of pressure. Not at all. God I, I, does that when you need him. God shows I, you. I, I, I would hope that I would hope that I would just die, you know, that, that I would, but they, they're very good at keeping you alive. So, so you can't just die, but, but I would hope that I would stand up to it and, and, uh, and uh, suffer as they did in that book. And you, you have to admire them. And, and uh, they, they say also the reason the church grew so fast in the first uh second century is is because of nero and the 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 the, uh, the emperors that were tortured the christians and threw them to the lions and did these horrible things to christians uh the church grew at a really fast rate because as people are being burned to death slowly they're singing hymns yeah and right. so on and 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 and, and the crowd instead of they would go there to celebrate thinking they're going to have a great time and and they the crowd was sickened and many of the people were so impressed with the people's faith that that, that Christianity boomed because right. of it. Yeah. But how how could you, to, to the listener now, I mean, could you stand up to that? I don't know if I could. I don't think any person ever did based on their own merit. I believe that God really shows up when these things are, are he, it's all, he's the source. And I believe that he will always show up. If you are his and it's required of you to die a martyr's death, God will give you the strength. Do you remember the man who was burned at the stake and said, lift your finger if, if you're able to bear it as they burn you alive. And he lifted up too in the, in the midst of it to him. Amen. So, yeah. you know, and when they were eaten by lions, they would take, they call us the 666 symbol, but it's not. It was used for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They would raise their hand as they were being eaten to let them know they're still standing for the faith, even though they're dying. So uh, it's it's absolutely amazing. What's ironic is it, they claim to be of Christ and servants of God. Many of them that did this horrible stuff to those people yep. claim to be uh, purging them of their sin so that their immortal soul is saved by the fire. And the torturing them and purging the devils out of, I mean, just any sick reason they can think to justify torturing these people unto death. And they say they're doing it in service of God. And we know one church that's got lots of blood and are drunk on the blood of the saints. And it's the yep. one Catholic church. Yep. Uh, now there's a footnote in the NABRE. So let's look at that. The footnote for verse nine and uh, nine through 13. And it reads, uh, a rhetorically, oh, let me wait till Matthias pulls it up for a bit. Verse 9 through 13, the footnote. It says, a rhetorically effective catalog of the circumstances of apostolic existence in the course of which Paul ironically contrasts his own sufferings with the Corinthians' illusion that they have passed beyond the folly of the passion and have already reached the condition of glory. His language echoes that of the Beatitudes and woes which assert a future reversal of present conditions. Their present sufferings uh, place the apostles in the class of those to whom the Beatitudes promise future relief. Uh, whereas the Corinthians image of themselves as already filled, rich, ruling, as wise, strong, and honored, places them paradoxically in the position of those whom the woes threaten with future undoing. They have lost sight of the fact that the reversal is predicted for the future. Uh, 
But I, I think I, I think when we started this, I, if I remember correctly, we th thought that the writing of this was in the mid uh, the mid fifties, around fifty two or three or four, five, something like that. Uh, and so uh, at that time, the, the persecution, uh, you know, I imagine. I don't remember if, if it was Nero at this time or, or later uh, when, this, when this was written. I've got a timeline on it, but I don't want to go and refer, try to look it up right now. Uh, but uh, timeline that shows you when the books were written and who was the emperor at the time and, and, and so on. But uh, I, I think that uh, according to this, it sounds like uh, the apostles, probably by this time, some of the apostles had already been killed Okay, any, any more on that before we go to verse 10? No, sir. Okay, let's look at verse 10 in the KJV. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Renee? Yeah, I think he's going back to what he was saying. You're kings, you've arrived. The apostles, though, we're, and he's showing the opposite. You know, again, God's kingdom with the world's kingdom and the attitude of humility. When he says, we are fools for Christ's sake, talking about the apostles, but ye are wise in Christ. You're kings, you've arrived with your revelations. We're weak, but you're strong. You're honorable, but we're hated, we're despised. So again, it's back and forth with, um, with the sarcasm, I believe. Yeah, more sarcasm. Uh, here it is, Brother Cripps, in the uh, Amplified. Awesome. We are regarded as fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are highly esteemed, but we are dishonored. Mm. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with the win what Renee was reading it to be it's more sarcasm. Um, he's just getting this point across even more. He's pounding away on this so that people understand it. Um, in reference also to what he's saying in verse eight about the spiritual gifts, um, I am happy to be regarded as a fool for Christ. Absolutely happy. To be regarded in that way, um, I don't want to be in the other end where I'm where I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, "Yeah, I'm a Christian, um, so I'm I'm awesome uh, because I have great discernment or I have great spiritual gifts, um, especially spiritual gifts." I mean, I don't I don't know why it seems this way, but it seems like uh, people that that really uh, uh, go on and on about the gifts they have, um, like how many YouTube videos I've seen where someone. Um, is passing along the prophetic revelation that they got in, in a dream. Um, and, and I'm careful not to mock it because I, I know the Bible refers to a time when God will, will pour out a spirit onto us and we'll see visions and we'll have dreams. Um, but I don't always agree that everyone that says that they're getting some revelation that no one else has, they're passing along to us because they got it in a dream. Um, it is always uh, that way. So um, uh, they're they're lifting themselves up as uh, something um, uh, uh, out of the Bible, other than what's said in His Word. And the way that we can figure that out is if if someone's saying something that the Word doesn't tell us, we can automatically know that it's not some uh, uh, revelation only given to one person. Um, what's going to be cool is when He does pour His Spirit out. And Renee uh, calls me up and says, Brother Cripps, I had this dream last night and um, I had the same dream. And we call Brother Luke and Brother Luke had the same dream. And uh, we get Matthias in on it and he had the same dream. That'll be a confirmation that we're all receiving the same thing. Um, and I, gosh, I look forward to that day. But in this in this sense, I'm happy to be regarded as a fool for Christ. I don't want to be on that other camp where I'm lifting myself up as I know more than anybody else at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Did I read that in the Amplified? Yeah, I did. Yep. Okay, uh, I guess that, that'll be the last verse for tonight from, because it's uh, past 11 in, in the East, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll comment on it briefly here. Uh, uh, oh, fool for Christ. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember I told you, but right after I got saved, people started saying I was Jesus freak, some kind of a fanatic and stuff. Then I started, when I started my street preaching, um, it was typical. People would say, oh, you're such a fool as they're walking by a fool. And I said, yeah, I'm a fool for Christ, you know, quoting that. And then they say, you're crazy. Yes, I'm crazy about Jesus. Uh, they give me one finger. And I said, yeah, amen, Jesus is number one. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've experienced this, uh, the, these kinds of um, uh, treatment. I'm, I'm glad that I, I didn't have to get, you know, beheaded and thrown blinds and stuff. But uh, today, we, the, at least in America today, so far, uh, the worst that happens to us is uh, sometimes we get may get arrested for our faith. Sometimes we may get ridiculed. Sometimes even a little violence. But uh, what the apostles went through, what the church has gone through out of all of history, even what believers are still going through, the executions and torture and imprisonment of Christians around the world today. Yeah, yeah. It, it's still happening. Yep. Um, okay, let's uh, let we'll end it here. Uh, we'll pick up with verse eleven next time. Uh, let's see if the chat room has anything to say that we need to respond to. Can I throw so, one thing in, Brother Luke, before? Yes. Uh, yes, just yes. Real, real quick, what you mentioned, what you touched on briefly right there, I just want to say there are people right now as we speak in other countries being horribly um, persecuted for believing in God and believing in Christ. It absolutely is happening. And you notice that the it doesn't get much coverage here. It's as if it's of no interest to the media at all that this is even going on. You have to really look to even find the stories uh, being presented by uh, uh, isolated uh, networks and, and to, to get the information. Um, it's, I, I, believe, I believe, biblically speaking, it's going to get worse and worse, and we will see that here. Um, again, as I said earlier, we, we're starting to see it in little ways, especially with the gender stuff that's happening and people being persecuted for, for using the wrong pronoun. It's just, it's just getting ridiculous. Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change over. We're going to be demonized and we're going to be, um, we're going to be persecuted more and more and more. Um, so uh, in, in answer to the idea of whether we'll be able to stand, I firmly believe uh, that the Holy Spirit in us will help us to stand and we won't be standing on our own power at all. We'll know what to say and how to say it and we will be able to endure. I just have to have to trust and believe in that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so that, that finishes the scripture study for tonight. So I ask uh, uh, Renee, um, give us a little summary of your thoughts on the time tonight, the study and, and uh, any Final words or any announcements? I have a couple of announcements I want to make at the end. So, Renee, first. I think theme here is humility and unity. We are all one body. Whatever we receive personally is for everyone within the body of Christ. And uh, everything is Christ. Uh, it's all him. As, as uh, Brother Cripps kept saying, it's all Christ. It's all Christ. And uh, I like this particular section. I like to see Paul do this, um, the way he talks to them. And it's interesting because when people read it, they don't get the context of that. They don't, they don't understand what he's doing there a lot of times. Like when he does do the question, shall we sin? So Grace Mayer, like he answers the question before they ask it and takes the other person's side to explain what their thinking is. Yeah. And it makes these sarcastic uh, uh, comments that are uh, so opposite. He's showing the opposites. We're despised, but you're honored. We're weak, but you're strong. You know, he um, he really goes there. And uh, I I think it's it's Im important that um, that we don't go off in factions. Look at all the denominations we got now. All that it, there shouldn't be denominations in the body of Christ. 
Amen. It's the body of Christ. Amen. It's One mind. I'm of Calvin. I'm of Luther. I'm Arminian. Mm-hmm. I'm Roman Catholic. I'm mm-hmm. there's one body. Yeah. And, and many members, and we need all of them equally, all equally important with different gifts, and it all works together as a body. He's not going to leave a foot or a toe or a finger. It's all necessary, and uh, no one is greater. And as Paul is uh, confirming again, if you want to be great, you need to be the least. Yeah. That's how you're great in God's kingdom is you are of low report. Yep. You're even abused and possibly die and be hated, just like our Lord. We're not better than our Lord. Nope. What he endured. They he said they, the world's going to hate us because they hated him first. Yeah. Uh, I think it's always important. Uh, unity, uh, humility, and Christ-centeredness. It's really good to see everybody. 50-some people all over the world studying the Bible tonight, Brother Luke. Isn't that fantastic? I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, Br- Brother Cripps, is gonna give us your closing thoughts. Yeah, absolutely, great, uh, great study tonight. And if I had to walk away with anything, I would, I, I would uh, walk away again with the same thing that Paul started this, uh, uh, the chapter out with, and the, the and the chapters of this book. Um, in laying the foundation and not giving up the foundation that was laid and being careful how we uh, how we uh, remain faithful in that be good stewards of the of the um, of the foundation which has already been laid and don't leave that um, extremely important and important uh, as the sarcasm of Paul regales us <laughs> and reminds us, that we're not to think too highly of ourselves and not to think that we've arrived anywhere um, and that every gift that God gives is from him. It's a gift. We didn't give it to ourselves. We received it gratefully from him and uh, that it's nothing to brag or boast about. Very good summary. Uh, If a person came in late and just heard your summary there, they would have understood it all, huh? Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, um, uh, I want to ask everybody now to pray for my wife. I just got a text message from her now, and she is just got off an airplane, and she is on a layover for a connecting flight. She's in Chicago. She's on her way back to Connecticut, where she grew up and her family is. And she goes for 40 years. She's been going back every year to visit her family. And she'll be gone for about a month. So wow. pray for her to have a safe trip, uh, a great time, and pray for me because I'm already lonely. <laughs> she, she left and then if, immediately, as soon as I get home, I'm lonely. Luke, who's going to feed what? you? How are you going to eat? Did she put a bunch of frozen stuff in the, in the, in the freezer for you? TV dinner. She's, she's, Every time she's, I, she's feeding you, she's at the door bringing you a plate. We spent the last couple of weeks shopping for great deals uh, for and the, our freezer and refrigerator stocked up with everything. And uh, But I'm a good cook. I've been cooking oh. for myself for the last few years. So uh, I'm going to eat a lot of uh, steaks and, and, and uh, you know, I'm a carnivore. I'm on the carnivore diet pretty much. So I, I know how to cook for myself pretty well. So no TV dinners for me, but... Uh, uh, yeah, she did take a lot of time to you know, get everything ready so that Every I can. Every time we end, you're like, My wife's calling me. She's got dinner. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess uh, um, the, the study was great tonight as usual. Uh, thank you to the chat room for, and I guess someone asked in the beginning about Friday, and so let me say it again now. Uh, last Friday was... Uh, a problem and I want to prevent that problem from happening again. So um, I am determined now to continue the program, but we've got to figure out a way of doing it and that will uh, prevent any future problems. So we're working on some solutions, but expect us to, to have the program 930 Eastern on Friday, Fellowship Friday. And but uh, uh, at that time, I'll, I'll will announce, you know, the, the, the changes that are necessary to make it work. Okay. So join us on Friday for Fellowship Friday. All right. Um, if there's nothing else from the chat room, I'm not seeing any capital letters anywhere. So uh, thank you everybody for participating. 
Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus. Amen.